You know, the book of wisdom, it is, in a way, it's a, it's a, it's a book as Greek as it is a Hebrew, with this keen sense of the orderliness of the cosmos. And we heard it reflected in, our, in that beautiful psalm, that the heavens proclaim the glory of God. Many have argued that the modern sciences would never have gotten off the ground unless scientists believed in some deep level in the radical intelligibility of the world. And again, we take it so for granted, but think about that. It's strange that we should assume that every nook and cranny of the universe on the grandest scale, on the, on the smallest microscopic scale, is marked by intelligibility, ordered patterns. Why should that be true? Wouldn't it be far more reasonable to assume the universe would just take on a sort of chaotic form? Things kind of left to themselves tend to fall back into chaos. And yet, everywhere we look, there are signs of order. Which is why it is supremely ironic that especially in the minds of a lot of our young people, it's the sciences that disprove religion. Can I make bold to say, au contraire, right? <laughs> And I really mean that. On the contrary, the sciences prove the truth of religion. Because how do you explain radical universal intelligibility without appealing to some creative intelligence? And mind you, every single one of the founders of modern science, without exception, held this to be axiomatic, that they were discerning the patterns that reflect the mind of God. I found some traction, actually, apologetically, with this approach. Young people who revere the sciences, and God bless them for it. You know, science, that's the, that's the criterion of truth. Okay, fair enough. But go all the way to the bottom of the sciences, and you find exactly what the Book of Wisdom talks about. Exactly what the psalmist sings about. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. You know, there's a related one I find also useful apologetically with young people. Young people are passionate about certain moral themes, aren't they? You know, they're against the abuse of women, they're against slavery, they're against racism, and so on. And good for them. They're right to be against those things. The question I ask is, where do you think these objective moral values come from? Because no, no young person would say, well, that's just my little private opinion, and you know, you're entitled to yours. No, no, they're going to fight you, you know, tooth and nail, to say that sexism is wrong, and racism is wrong, and slavery is wrong. Sure they will, and they're right to do it. But it begs that question. Where do these objective moral values come from? In C.S. Lewis's language, where do the laws of the moral life come from if there's no law giver? So can I suggest that the very things that often the skeptics of religion most revere are themselves paths toward authentic religion? And I think the Book of Wisdom hints at that. Okay, how about that? That was a, that's called a fake homily on reading number one. Uh, the... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now, you know, the, the Gospel of Luke is so rich and so wonderful. But, you know, the line that even though we've heard it a thousand times takes our breath away, and it should, simply this. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses it will save it. You know, I mentioned the sciences and physics. Physics is filled with that kind of anomalous language, isn't it? If you get to the high points in physics, you know, things get sort of topsy-turvy, uh, counterintuitive. So it goes in the spiritual order. It's full of paradoxical claims like this one. Again, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. Well, everybody seeks to preserve his life, right? That's the most fundamental instinct behind our other instincts for wealth and power and pleasure. All those things are meant to hang on to and enhance my life, right? 
So the bottom line of human life is seeking to hang on to what I've got. But the Bible tells this story over and over again, Old Testament and New. The more you try that game, the less successful you'll be. The more you cling to it, the more you're going to lose it. The best example in the New Testament is the prodigal son story. Right? Father, give me my share of the inheritance coming to me. In, in one sentence, he manages to use the word me three times, right? Me, mine, give me, give me, give it to me now. Well, this is he, all of us, in regard to God. Give me that I might hang on to it. What happens, of course, is he fritters it all away very quickly and ends up destitute. Now, here, here's the spiritual physics. Here's exactly why. Grace only exists in gift form. That's what grace means, gratia, it's a gift, right? Whatever we have, whatever exists in the world is a grace because it comes from God's love. So whatever exists, exists in gift form. Therefore, if you want to hang on to it, you've got to give it away. And you'll find as you give it away, you get more. And when you get more, you give that away, and you get more. And what happens is now you live in this kind of loop of grace. You live on the edge. You live on the fly. That's why, you know, it's, to me it's so ironic. In the eyes of the world, oh, religion is kind of this nerdy, you know, this is for these sort of old fuddy-duddy type people. And Oh, we in, living in Las Vegas, we're living on the edge. No, they're not. They're living in the most tiresomely boring manner you can imagine. I mean that. We're the ones, if we take this language seriously, who are living on the edge. Think of, think of the great saints. And our saint for today, Elizabeth, I love her story. You know, this great uh, 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 queenly figure, you know, this high, royal, regal figure who gives it away. She gives it away to serve the poor. When we give grace away, we get more grace. And then we give that away and we get more grace. And we live in that edgy space, risking it all, risking it from moment to moment. What do I know? I don't quite know what's going to come next, but whatever I have, I give. If you try to hang on to a gift, what happens? It stops being a gift and you lose it. It's like the... Um, you know those little um, dandelion things, little cottonwood seeds that float around and if, if in the summertime. And if you want to grab one of those, or rather you want to get one of those, what shouldn't you do? If you try to grab it, you just push it away, right? Only when you sort of follow it and on its own rhythm and you wait for it to fall into your hand, only then will you get it. Well, grace is a bit like that. If I try to grasp at it, I will ipso facto push it away. So again, this is spiritual physics. Who, um, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, period. Whoever loses it will save it. That means whoever gives it away will keep it, <laughs> will keep real life. My great mentor, Cardinal George, had that wonderful line. He was so quotable, Cardinal George, you know. The only things that we will have in heaven are those things that we gave away on earth. That was his way of stating this principle. It's good, isn't it? The only things we'll have in heaven are the things that we gave away on earth because heaven is the place of sheer grace, of sheer love. So the more you get in the habit of giving away what you have, the more you live in the loop of grace the more you start anticipating life in heaven. That was Elizabeth of Hungary. That's her great lesson. So how about those two things? I don't know, how do we read them together now? If I were planning this homily, see, what I would have done, I would have thought, okay, there's reading one, reading two. So I don't really have a good connection. Um, I'll let you think about that. Um, but apolog apologetics and the heavens proclaiming the glory of God. And then... Gosh, the glory of God, maybe that's it. What's the, what's the glory of God? It is reflected in the heavens, that's true. They're grace too. The planet Saturn, you know, Jupiter, that's grace. What a gift these things are. 
And, and that's where the glory of God is made manifest when we participate in that loop of grace and allow the divine life to come more and more uh, to life in us.